Hello everybody and welcome to the Plant-Based Revolution Summit where a collection of the top paid plant-based entrepreneurs have been brought together to share with you how you can create a full-time income online in the vegan niche doing what you love. Even if you're coming from a place of zero technical experience and don't have any followers on social media yet. Here you'll learn exactly what these entrepreneurs sell, how they sell it, and how they've built their audiences so you can do the same for yourself. Today we've got Durian Ryder on the show, and Durian Ryder, if you don't know him by now, uh, he's probably one of the top vegans on YouTube, definitely most one of the most controversial vegans on YouTube, and it's from him that I first got into YouTube, it's from him that most people, or not most people, but a lot of people became vegan and became vegan content creators. He's probably one of the, uh, the, the, the grandfathers of the, uh, the vegan YouTube scene, so I'm very, very uh, honored to be interviewing him today for the summit. It's going to be cool to see uh, how he's started his career online and what advice he'd give you to start your career online as well. So without further ado, welcome, Darren Ryder. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah. So, hey, for people who don't know, what is your real name? Harley, jo- Harley Johnstone. Harley Johnstone. And yeah. how come on Instagram it says Darren Ryder is with an S? Because uh, my first account I had for many years uh, was deleted, and so I lost that. So I started up next day with another one. I couldn't use the name Duran Rider because it's been taken, even though it's gone. So I had to call it Duran Riders. Oh, I see. And on YouTube a long time ago too, I remember your channel was called Duran Riders as well. What was the reason? Yeah, for that? it's similar, similar sort of thing. And so, when, you, when you said your Instagram account got deleted, like I remember looking back at your Instagram account, it had like well over. I think over like 100,000 followers or something at one point. Yeah, I think we were on like 150K or something like that. Um, yeah. and then, boom, boom, boom. Gone. And we were talking about this the other day. You have no idea why it just got, it got deleted. Just either somebody hacked or Instagram deleted or something, but you don't know. Yeah, I've got theories, but it, no, it got, no, uh, got no response to Instagram. Theory could have been hacked. I also put up a picture of uh, – I had a fangirl send me uh, a semi-nude. I put that up. And uh, which was unusual because uh, Instagram has a lot of you know, bikini girls on there, and so uh, I put it up in context because this girl had said that I was pursuing her, and I was like, "Well, <laughs> these are sort of pictures you've been sending me." So yeah, bit of, I guess it comes the territory, a bit of controversy, and uh, live on the edge. Wow. So, so things get deleted. Yeah, people work so hard; they like spend a bunch of money. They they dedicate their lives to building up their Instagram. To, to like there a lot of people have the goal of like wanting to reach a hundred thousand followers, you know, and then you know you were well past that for years, and then poof, it's all gone. So, how do you mentally just get back on track right away and start creating content all over again instead of just giving up? Yeah, with that's, that's a great question, Ted. You just got to focus on what, what's your goal. You know, my goal was to create content, create community, contribute, contribute primarily, and how to contribute, create content, create content, create content, build community, and so. Just deleted within a few hours, I had a new one back up. So yeah. Now you're yeah you're known in my, in my eyes at least as like one of the top content creators. Like if there's one person who's created more content than any other vegan on YouTube, it's it's you. Like you just you relentlessly put out content. I remember you made a video many years ago. You're like if you're wondering how much content to put out, the answer is more. How much yeah. more? <laughs> and like you'll upload maybe like two three videos a day sometimes, right? Maybe even more. Um, yeah, um, I do spend, Yeah, you know, I could definitely outload more myself as well. You know, I spend uh, a lot of time mentoring other YouTubers out there. Um, I've got Natasha at the moment. And so I do spend a lot of time mentoring in my, in my Facebook group and stuff like that because I'm trying to build the community that way as well. I was like, you know, helping other people get going. Because it's a great example of like over the years, people say, no, that's, that's bad. That's a bad business model, Harley. You know, you should all keep all to yourself. And I disagree because what happens, you know, when my YouTube channel got deleted a few years ago, um, and then it got reinstated. Let's say I didn't get reinstated. What would have happened then if I was the only, you know, vegan YouTuber with 200 million views and I got deleted, then there'd be, you know, there'd be no high carb Hannah or freely or, or, you know, the crew over the years sort of helped from day one get their channel going. So there'd be just no real community going. There'd be no vegan games. There'd be no Nick the Vegan. There'd be, None of these people out there who got into YouTube, no, there'd be no Joe Carbstrong, there'd be no James Aspie, uh, there'd be no Bonnie Rebecca Lovana, which is a pretty good thing now. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but 
there, there would be there would be not there, that community wouldn't be there. And right. so even people, you know, I might sledge or bit of banter with people like Bonnie Rebecca or the ex-vegans, but they still had value from when they were doing from 2014 to peaking at 2017. They still had this great momentum of pushing veganism into high carb vegans to these young women out there who were going to the supermarkets, buying product, buying fruit, buying tofu or you know, vegan chicken burgers or whatever and vegan pizzas. So that created massive demand, massive financial momentum for these corporate industries to create more vegan product. Now in Australia, the vegan movement's quite big. And I would largely say that's because of me like pushing on social media. Like I was flashing all the cash, look how much money I'm making on YouTube. And all these, you know, these people say, oh, well, I mean, Harley's having a fun life. He's making money. I want to do that too. You know, how can I do that? And I'm like, hey, come to Thailand. And, uh, you know, so I was, I was just encouraging all these people. I was flashing cash. And I remember Joey Carbstrong, he was working as a, a lollipop man, like he holds up a sign at a construction thing. You know, he's just so he's working a shit kicker job he hated. He's like, I want to make money, I want to do what you're doing. I'm like, man, I'll help you out. And I created his channel name, Joey Carbstrong, because his last name's Armstrong, and I just gave him shout outs and built him up and helped him with his street interviews and stuff like that. So, and now he's doing really well today financially. He's making, he's making, a, he's crushing it, he's making a killing. Same with James Aspie. I've got this James Aspie, he's got like an edge in the. I remember so freely, uh, sort of give him an interview on the channel and let's, let's, let's launch his career. And uh, so just getting people started, same with like Rovana, met her in New York in 2012. She had no YouTube, no social media presence at all. And I said, you should do a Spanish vegan thing. She's like, do you think so? And I said, yeah. And she, she did really, really well. So I think of all the, for a while then, then she just, you know, lost the chops and went off the vegan wagon. But think of those, all that money that was spent by their audience, mm -hmm. you know, that, that changes the system. Yeah. And so that's why I big believe I'm, I'm definitely, yeah, I would be a multi-millionaire now if I just kept it for me, but the vegan community in the world would have massively suffered. Right. You know, so I would have more money, but who cares about money? If my goal to help the vegan thing get out there isn't achieved, right. I could have a billion, $10 billion in my pocket I mean, that would be actually pretty good for, for veganism, actually. <laughs> you know, hypothetically, um, you know, I'd, I'd be you know, a few million in the bank, but that wouldn't be doing zip for vegan. You know, a few million dollars is nothing, really. But, you know, millions and millions of dollars all around the world, people buying stuff, that, that definitely adds up, for so, sure. So I think yeah, that yeah, helps you, a lot. You were, you were definitely one of the first, if not the first, vegan YouTuber I saw who was, like, showing how much money they're making online, right? Buying all these bikes and showing your YouTube earnings and everything. And that was really cool. Um, and definitely inspired a lot of people to get started. Um, but what was your life like before getting on YouTube? Like, how long had you been vegan? And, and what was it about being vegan? that triggered you or gave you insight that hey i should get on youtube i was vegan in 2001 went vegan after having some health issues chronic fatigue and uh you know, digestive issues crohn's disease colitis whatever you want to call it just bleeding from the bowel different specialists said different things nothing we can do we have to do medication can't cure that and so i had all these asthma and stuff like that issues breathing issues so i just felt yuck I just felt yuck. And I'm like, I'm young. I'm 20. I shouldn't be feeling claggy. In 2001, you were how old? Uh, 2001. Born in 1977. So that's 24. So 24. No, hang on. That's about that. 23, 24, something like that. Right. And um, yeah, so then went vegan. That, that was back in the day. You know, the first, book, first vegan book I read was Food Revolution by John Robbins. And luckily... There was some, some McDougal in there. There was some Bernard, and it was just talking about carbohydrates, eat carbs, and things like that. So I just got a, a great book to sort of start with. And as an athlete, I'm like, okay, pasta, rice, yeah, let's rock and roll. And uh, then started coaching people, you know, fat people, like really fat people were coming in for advice, and uh, fat friends, you know, like big, obese, you know, like jump on the airplane, take up two seats style, and a seat and a half, and they, and they were just shredding weight, just eating high carb, low fat. And it just felt really good seeing them transform their life, getting off diabetes medications, and and it was just it was just it was crazy back then because there was no social media, and it was just all face to face, 
and you know the doctors and stuff in the psych committee were freaking out like oh, Harley can't we do all this this is dangerous and I'm like oh, these people are losing weight getting off diabetes medications man stuff works and and so my conviction was built really quickly really strong helping people out with the weight loss and fitness which I've been doing since 1996 you know coaching friends and stuff and then as I did it professionally in 99 you know, joined worked in a gym as a personal trainer and so yeah then uh, went from there just just building on that and just you know, understanding more and more and more about human communication making mistakes with that myself you know frustrating people or frustrating myself and just learning that there's different types of personalities out there and better understanding how to read someone within a few seconds of meeting them what's their goal what's their triggers how can where are they now where they want to go and how can we help them get there and so this is just my obsession every day i just love human human communication and helping people achieve their, their fitness weight loss lifestyle goals and mood goals and mm -hmm. you know, all the good stuff and then helping yeah. the planet at the same time so, so so you read a book you got inspired you felt great yourself and then you started getting great results people came to you wanting those same results you started helping them and then i guess one of the mm -hmm. maybe maybe one of the enemies that you faced early on was that like people telling you hey harley you're not certified you can't do this it's not safe whatever <laughs> meanwhile they're getting results but but what what triggered you to actually get on YouTube, and what were some of the challenges you faced once you started getting on YouTube? Yeah, so you, yes, great. I'll answer your question. Yeah, YouTube, two thousand six. I was in Thailand, and uh, I was with a friend Kelly. We we're in this internet cafe, and she's she had a so I think she's doing a bikini and stuff, and she's like showing me YouTube, and I was like, oh, you know, what's that? And she's like, you should get on the Harley. Like, you know, it should be a great platform for him. Like, oh, I don't even have a computer. You know, this is before smartphones are out. I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that. It sounds complicated. I'm like a fruitarian, natural living. So like, yeah, that's great, but you use the internet. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do too. You know? So she was putting all these really positive debates to me, you know, strong debates rather. And my cognitive distance was kicking in. I was like, oh, she's like, you should do it. I said, okay, show me YouTube. And uh, she's just trying to help me. Yeah, God bless her. And uh, the YouTube at the time was banned in Thailand because someone did a video about the king. And so I was like, oh, YouTube, it's not even in Thailand. How good is it? And so I just had all these little hurdles in my head. And then in 2008, I finally got on YouTube. And I had no later. Yeah, I was just totally computer literate. I still have today pretty, pretty, pretty uh, <laughs> poor behind the computer. But I know how to press record. I know how to press upload. I know how to type in a title description. And I know how to take a thumbnail. And that's what you need <laughs> to do to have a really successful YouTube career and inspiring other people. And so then, and then I was with me and Freely got together in 2007. And Freely was like, yeah, you should be on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And then went from there. And then I was doing it on YouTube for a bit. And I started telling Freely, hey, you know, we need some girls on the YouTube. You get on there. And she's a bit like, you know, as girls are, massively self-conscious. And, and it wasn't until 2013 when I was maybe making like $10,000 10, a month easily on YouTube. Sometimes more. And then I remember Freely looking over my shoulder. She's like, did you make $10,000 last month? And I'm like, I've been trying to tell you. She's like, all right, I'm going to do a video a day now. <laughs> so she's like a video a day. She's like, what do I do? What should I wear? What thumbnails and all this stuff? And then she started cranking her on. And so uh, went from there. Wow. But before that, it was, very, it, was a bit, it was a struggle to get free onto YouTube. But once you saw the money that's been made on there, and it went from there. You know, it went from there. So, when you first started making YouTube videos, or did you have any like mentors or people you looked up to, or you, people you wanted to replicate their style of, or like got ideas from to make videos? Or how did how did you yeah, work your style? I uh, great question. Um, Matt Monarch, uh, I, actually, he was a big trigger as well to be on YouTube because he was in Thailand, in Chanaburi, Thailand, and he's using all these plastic bags for durian. I remember watching his video. Think, oh cool matt's in in thailand that's pretty cool and i was watching this video on the bus and then he goes to the market and he uses all these plastic bags and i'm like matt are you see like what and i was just i was just outraged so i literally you know clicked off the video and it finished i literally rode my bike to the camera store bought a hundred dollar pentax camera made my first ever video in chanaburi thailand still up and uh just trying to encourage people about plastic bags and stuff like that you know and so Matt Monarch was also a catalyst as well. Who's the inspiration for me to get on YouTube and, and you know, help dilute the pollution out there. Yeah. Um, there was, you know, I stayed with Mike Arnstein in 2011 and just seeing how hard Mike is working. He's, he's balancing his family, his business, his sport, his fitness, his, you know, health. And just seeing he's always on the hustle. Uh, 
that inspired me a lot living with Mike Arnstein of like, hang on, I'm sort of not really doing that much here. I could be doing a lot, lot more. And I can still be doing a lot more right now as well. So yeah, just, you know, people out there just uh, smashing out content. Um, I remember Life Regenerator, Dan, the man, ATM. I remember seeing him, he was, you know, he, he treats like a full on business. And I, I didn't really want to be sales or business. I was just like, I'll just do a video when I feel like it, you know, it's just part of the flow. Mm-hmm. And he's just like banging it out, you know, for yeah. sales and stuff like that. So he, Which, you know, so Dan, Dan kind of motivated you or gave you the example of like just creating more content, more content. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and watching Dan making these simple videos and people connecting with that. And I'm like, well, that's what I do as well. But I looked at how many videos Dan was doing. I looked at how many videos I was doing. And we're using a similar format, just a talking head, one take video. Yeah. And Dan's just smashing out the content. And I'm just like, hang on, he's got 1,300 videos. I've got 300 videos. Yeah. What am I doing? You know, what am I doing? So yeah, Dan was also inspired me to do more work as well. Um, and then, yeah. Then I helped Fully Well Christina get on the, on the YouTube. And uh, a lot of over the people over the years get them going on. And, uh, what yeah, were what were some of your challenges when you first got on YouTube? Like, did you find that nope, the crickets came when you launched a video? Like, you just weren't getting many views, or like, you yeah, I get like or what was ten that? views overnight. You know, and uh, I got on YouTube primarily because I was getting all these emails from people and they asked me the same question again and again. I'm like, well, hang on, if I just do a YouTube video as well, oh, you know, I can answer the question video and send them a link. So that was another motivation to get on YouTube. It wasn't until 2011 that you could really monetize your account. You had to apply and be a YouTube partner. So I did it for three or four years, but absolutely free. Just purely wanting to, to help people. I had nothing for sale, nothing at all. And I just thought it was a great medium to get on this. So I was getting, you know, 10 views, 20 views, 100 views per, per video. And then eventually got up to 200 views overnight. And uh, I remember the first day I monetized my account, I think I made two cents, you know? And uh, and I think the first month made like eleven dollars or something. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was just uh it was yeah, good times, just very virginal and, and raw and innocent. And uh, yeah, that those are the days. So then, so yeah, so, so um, you you start cranking out all these videos more and more. You start monetizing it. Your monthly incomes go up and up and up until the point you're making like ten grand a month. And then that that went on for a few years, but then maybe it was a couple of years ago or something, YouTube basically hacked it, uh, slash it in half, cool. right? Everybody like got half their earnings. Um, yeah, what were they called? I think you called it an uh, adpocalypse or something. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the, the bubble burst. Yeah. I think PewDiePie put up some controversial content and a lot of big advertisers pulled. And yeah, basically everybody just got slashed. Yeah. Right. And uh, in a way it was sort of good because it showed who was who. and But, it was, uh, yeah, so you, there's a lot less money now on YouTube. It's right. still there. It's definitely still a career option if you're going to work hard for it. It's definitely a lot tougher. Yeah. The, the wall is steeper. You've got to really climb that wall. Back in, back in the days, it was just like, hey, come in. We're just, YouTube was just throwing money at people. They're just like, here, you want to make a video of sharks? Boom. But you're like spiders, yeah. <laughs> bikini models. They're just throwing money. It was insane. Like, yeah. It was insane. And, uh, you know, that was, that was, you're basically printing money. Yeah. Right. I was literally like, well, I want to buy this bike, so I'll make a video about the sharks, you know, do 10 shark videos, and they'll give me a 10 grand bike, <laughs> literally. And um, it was insane back then. Yeah, yeah then Adpocalypse came on, and uh, boom, the bubble burst big right. time. And so yeah. you're, still, you're still making, is it the majority of your money still coming from ads on your YouTube videos right now? Um, I've got a few income streams. I've got YouTube. AdSense, I've got my bicycle company, I've got my ebooks, and I've got my coaching. So that's uh, one, two, three or four income yeah. streams oh, plus yeah. a bit of crypto, nice. um, things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, and- I think it's good to have multiple income streams. If you're looking at you know, doing a sort of, some sort of career online, passive income, traveling around the world, digital nomad, having multiple income streams is a good idea. I think mean, because if one, if, if one, gets pulled down you still got three or four floating around definitely so, i remember yeah. the first time i ever heard about multiple income streams i think it was from bob proctor he talked about how like all like the richest people man they have multiple streams of income and all the broke people or the people who are working nine to fives they have that one stream of income that's it it's like having one stream of income is insane because if you get fired 
or you quit or whatever, like that's it. You have no income at all. Whereas if you have multiple income streams, then no matter what's happening, like one goes down, you still got all the others. So, um, yeah, it was a lot yeah, of me hearing about that. But when I got started online too, and even to this day, um, I wanted to set up multiple. I had the YouTube, I had the eBooks, I had the coaching, right? Just like you're doing. I was selling fruit. I had like a mini uh, co-op going. So it's, it's kind of, it's like what you have now. You have the bikes, you have the coaching, you have the uh, eBooks and the, the AdSense, right? Yeah. Um, and you had a course for a while with Sean. You don't, you don't sell courses anymore? Um, I don't. That, uh, I don't. I'm not sure um, where Sean is these days. Sean is a good guy. Yeah. You, you heard from Sean? No, he must, he's, must be in Vegas. Really? Yeah, he lives in, he started like a Las Vegas productions company. And then, but after a few videos, I think he stopped creating videos on that. But yeah, very successful yeah. guy, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I've, I've met a lot of amazing people over the years in this lifestyle and digital nomads, stuff like that. And it's, it's taught me that, you know, you can make insane money you can make more money than you know what to do with, but it won't make you happy. Yeah. That's, that's another one. So often people, oh, if, you, uh, if I just had more money, I'll be happy. It's like, <laughs> you can't be happy now, dead broke. Some of the happiest times in my life was living dead broke, homeless, living on welfare on the beach and you know, getting my fruit from the market and that's all my money for the week sort of thing. Like, I remember being so broke, I did a water fast for two days on the beach in Malaysia until my next welfare check came through. That's how broke it was. But that was total bliss. What's yeah, the it was tattoo total bliss say? Well. What's the tattoo say? Oh, the tattoos, we've got a PMAR and we've got vegan over here. So, yeah. But, so I've had this contrast of being dead broke, not a cent to my name. The only possessions was my bicycle and uh, my clothes in my back. And that was it. And my bicycle helmet. That was it. Nothing more than that. <laughs> And uh, maybe a bag of clothes at my friend's house back in Adelaide. So, and bike tools. But, uh, you know, everything I can carry essentially on my backpack. And, well, for uh, those who don't know what PMAR, the reason I ask is because, like, that's, like, your motto, right? It's one of your mottos. It's just positive mental attitude regardless. Yeah. And having a tattoo on your hand, people ask you, it's a reminder, it's your focus. So, that's that's a big trap. Because everyone's listening to this podcast here, this, this, this production now. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll make money. I'll be super happy. I'm going to get hot and fit. And, and at last it's going to be great. And it's like, well, nah, you know, <laughs> it'll be different. It won't be better. Right. It'll be different. Yeah. For some people, I see people on social media and their life's worse after success, you know, and fame because their trolls came in or people use them or they, they realize how shallow society is, blah, blah, blah. And so they're almost like more haggard and aged now versus before they started their career, you know? Mm. Um, so I won't mention names, but you can just look around, you know, right. uh, peop the people's life quality is, you know, they, they, they got on the social media thing and they're going to make it famous. And now they're looking haggard, haggard, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah. So what, what is an average day in the life now for Durian Rider as far as your business goes? Like, do you wake up and make a video right away or do you wake up and like change your state of mind with fitness first and then make a video once you're inspired? Or, or how, do you, how do you create content on a regular basis? How do you keep the income flowing on a regular basis? Um, I don't try and keep income flowing because I've made more money than I, I'll ever sort of need. So I, I don't come from a place of like, I have to make money today. I come from a place of like, I want to do what I've always done, create content. And so... Uh, but let's say you, let's, I'll try and put myself in position of someone who's, who's, you know, who's dead broke and they've got kids and they need to make money. All right? I'll put myself in their shoes because my reality is a reality that most people in the world don't live. So I can say, yeah, I'll wake up and go for a ride and have your sex and go to the market and just do all those things. And but that's most people's reality isn't going to be like that ever or because they've, they've got kids or whatever. And so I would say that just wake up and do the most important things first. You know, so that would be creating content, uploading a video, you know, and maybe moderating comments as well. Moderating comments is very important because if you're having all these trolls who are fighting your channel and they're saying, you know, you're ugly, you're fat, or you're skinny, or you're this color or that color, or you believe, that creates this like negative narrative in the comment section. 
all right? So that's, that's, that's not good, unless your maybe name is Trisha Paytas, and she loves the troll, and that's just, you know, because you have good health, she's just doing train wreck stuff, and, and she loves that. So if you're, you've got to find out what your niche is, all right? So if your niche is bicycle tech, then having a negative social narrative isn't good. If your is total drama, total drama, then negative comments is all right, you know, because it's just like chaos in there. But uh, if the negative comments are directed at you, it's probably not the best thing for your brand, you know. But again, it depends on what your niche wants to be. So let's say you're probably watching this, you're thinking, I want to do vegan and health, then it's very important that you control the social narrative in the comments section. Very, very important. So every day, you know, uh, you can wake up and check your comments and, and go through that. And this is the thing, a lot of people wake up and they can't handle waking up to negative comments. You know, they first wake up in the morning, they just look at the phone. The first thing is, you're ugly. You've got horse teeth. Who are you? You know, blah, blah, blah. And if, if you're reading that first thing in the morning and you're not mentally strong, then that can crush you all day. <laughs> so, so when I see a neg comment and I hit delete and block, I'm like, I was like popping a pimple, you know? Like some people go in the mirror and see a pimple and go, oh my God, I've got a pimple. This is disgusting. Oh my God. Can't go out in public. If I see a zit, I'm like, oh, that's a big one. Oh, oh, that stung. Man, they hit the mirror. You know, it's dumb. So, same with troll comments. If you're getting social disapproval get to you, you've already lost. Already lost on day one. And day 1,000, when you've got 100K subs or million subs, and you've got some people making videos about you, look how old this person looks, or... Yeah, this person did this, blah, 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 blah. You got people making websites about you. You got haters just trapped eh, tra oh, yeah, you on your you have a website. There was a website called like Dirty Sucks or something, or 30 Bands a Day Sucks or something. Oh, there's, man, every, every year there's websites about me. You know, like people go hard, man. People go hard. So, and that's, that comes from fame. The more fame you have, you know, the more you'll have haters, especially if you're really living your truth. Like if you're one of these fake people who's just like, hey guys. You know, then you still get haters for being fake, but you just, it, yeah, you're, you're always gonna get haters. You can be the nicest pie person on the internet, and you know people who are really nice, and they're, they're getting, they get haters, you know. Yeah. So you're always gonna have haters, right? You're always gonna have a zit or, a, you know, a hair out of the place. It's just, it's just part of life. You're gonna have ants crawling your leg one day. Like, if you're freaking out about ants and mosquitoes, then you've already lost. Some <laughs> people who, they go to Thailand, they're like, I'm in Thailand, this is great. And a mosquito bites them and they start spraying all the chemicals and they're slapping it and they're complaining to the hotel staff and the hotel staff comes in the hotel room, fumigates it with all these toxic pesticides, rodenticides and fungicides and they're like, oh, I've got allergies from the pesticide, I've got to go to the doctors. And I say, like, what are you doing in Thailand, man? You know, like, wherever that person goes, they're always going to have problems because they haven't learned how to just go, chill you know, mm. and put things in perspective so so, so yeah. as far as as far as um what you'd recommend for a day in the life you know you're saying wake up yeah, day and life. content wake, wake question up. i would wake recommend wake up crack content yeah you know crack content crack content you can't put up too much content on social media because there's so much content on there now but think about how many people you got an average instagram account how many people people follow like a 500 people or a thousand people or five thousand people so people are, I'm just going to post every couple of days. Well, how are they going to find you? True. Yeah. True. Like, look how many videos I upload to YouTube every minute. Yeah. It's like days worth. Yeah. So, you know, you got, to, you got to upload so much content that your stuff always comes up somewhere because the, the market is saturated. So my daily routine, what I do, I wake up, I have my water, I have a bit of sugar, a piece of fruit within 10 minutes of getting up out of bed. Um, even if I go back to bed for whatever reasons, I'll have some fruit before I go back to bed. Just get some sugar in my system and into the <laughs> table to read them. Whatever I've got, right? Always start the day with a cup of water and a bit of fruit, a bit of sugars. Get your metabolism fired up, get your thyroid kicking over. And then um, after my morning routines, whatever that might be, physical, you know, morning cardio in the shower or morning cardio on the bike, I will start creating some content, upload some videos, go to my coaching group, ask questions, things like that. So generally in the mornings, my creative time, I know caffeine, I don't use any caffeine, any substance to wake up. I just turn on my phone, 
on my screen that blue light poof, gets <laughs> yeah. you going dude gets it's going. crazy i i growing up as a kid i remember like waking up i'd be so either like hung over or tired or whatever i couldn't get to bed but i open my laptop and instantly i'm like let's get to work like let's let's play these computer games like i'll just right away yeah it's a computer game that's what it is you know? yeah like it's so it's amazing so I love that, dude. I, when you do, when you say you do coaching, people who are curious of maybe getting some coaching from you, do you only do group coaching or do you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? Uh, I mean, I have a few pro cyclists and uh, people from Los Angeles. You can call them celebrities. I, I do one-on-one -on -one for them because they don't want to be in a, a public setting. Uh, that's very, very uh, occasional. But 99% of the time, it is in the group because the group, I like the group for me, it forces people to, uh, you know, meet more other people, community based, things like that. It's on Zoom, and, uh, video, video chat? No, no, no. Uh, some people I do video chat with, but it's mostly 99% of the time it's in my Facebook group. So people pay a one off fee and they get lifetime coaching in that Facebook group. Any okay. questions or anything it could be dating. It could be sex, it could be raw food, it could be fruit, it could be vegan, it could be the, uh, they want to buy a new bicycle. They're like, Harley, should I get this size or this model? Yeah. Or I want to get some new shoes? Or I'm training for the marathon. How can I drop five minutes off my time from last year? Just <laughs> any questions, any questions I answer. Is, are you making uh, YouTube video answers or just typing answers or both? Mostly typing, but I often do a video as well, video requests, and then I'll link it in the group. Nice, nice. Okay, and where can people um, sign up for that? Durnrider.com. Just have a browse for Durnrider.com. I've got my ebooks on there and my bikes and uh, the coaching group on there. Cool. Now, um, what? I'd, I'd be curious to hear your answer on this. I don't know if I've ever heard you answer this before, but um, be cool to get your take on it. What do you say to someone who's thinking about getting on YouTube in the vegan niche, but they're saying that it's already too saturated and they're not going to stand <laughs> out? Yeah, well, <laughs> they've already lost because <laughs> they're already looking for excuses and they're already setting themselves up to fail. They're giving, them, they're giving to themselves an excuse. Yeah, and that person is always going to fail in life, mm. you know. So I like to look at things as a, a holistic approach because I can look at little one little thing and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you say that, but why is this person saying that? This person is not committed. They're like, you know. And yeah, they might be thinking, oh, it's too saturated. And it is, it's, it is too saturated to be lazy. You got to go in there and unless you're the some 18 year old Russian bombshell, blonde, you know, <laughs> whatever, sort of crazy dimensions, YouTube's going to be a real struggle for you. And even if you are the 18 year old Russian blonde sh bombshell, you're going to have your haters as well. So, but you'll have a head start because you're aesthetics and you're demographic and niche, but you're still going to have your haters and stalkers and all that stuff. So, it's the same for everybody, really. Um, some people just have to work harder than others, you know, because you're always going to have haters. You're always going to be at the whim of YouTube. Your, your account could get deleted like that, and that's nothing you can do about it. So that's the nature of the game. It's like life. Like, you could die any day. You can walk down the street, and a car crashes into you, and you die. You die. You would be in a plane that crashes. You could get electrocuted any moment. You could slip over in the bathtub, crack your head and die or be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life in a vegetable state. You know, so any day your life could be over. So we would say, oh, YouTube doesn't have enough security. It's too wishy-washy. It's like, that's life. That is life. So if you're saying it's too saturated, you're already lost before you've even started. So when, you know, when, when like, beginners hear like, that, the beginners sorry, last, yeah. it's like going, I want to climb Mount Everest and you get to the bounce base of mount everest you know uh, it's just too steep it's just too steep and there's <laughs> weird looking there's weird looking goats on the rocks those goats look angry <laughs> so you've already lost so for beginners who are d just starting to crank up content they go okay during writer says a bit a day let's do a bit a day they start putting on these vids a day and they're getting like one or two views um how do they get more views on their videos any any special tactics that you use or any sort of like thumbnail tricks or title tricks that you use um, yeah, like my yeah. biggest videos, you've got to work on your niche. What, what, what assets do you have? Do you have aesthetic assets? Do you have, um, you know, like on TikTok now, you know TikTok? Yeah. That's exploding. Natasha's exploding on that. She's 
one of the videos almost 800k it's like you know you, you got to use what you got you got to use what you got so if you're you know let's say you've got you know massive burns across your face and you've only got one eye and you've got some artificial lips and that's that's really really good for youtube because your face is the thumbnail people are going to click on you know, and you're going to get a lot of viewers on youtube a lot of people are doing that on tiktok but for some reason, they don't go to YouTube. It's like, what are you doing? You're missing out on a huge career option there. Huge career option. It's crazy. But yeah. people just, people are just, they're, people are like, oh, I'll put it on TikTok, but I won't put it on YouTube. And it's like, well, YouTube is where the money is. TikTok ain't no money right now. Right. Maybe in the future, but right now. And see, so, yeah, that's where people miss out. It's crazy. It's crazy. I saw this person the other day, their, their thumbnail pictures like their face, and it's, you know, all these burns and look like their scalp got ripped off. And this person got like 3 million followers on TikTok and they've got no YouTube channel. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? They need to do the coaching group. Yeah, they're living in Indonesia. So they're making zero money from 3 million followers. Wow. Oh, oh man, crazy. Wow. So yeah, what, what picture do you use? It has to be relative to your title. Go to my channel and have a look. Or go to Natasha's channel you, and have you a, make a custom thumbnail for every video, or did someone just upload a video without a thumbnail? Uh, I, I don't custom thumbnail. My tip with the custom thumbnail is take the thumbnail from the video. If the thumbnail takes longer than 10 seconds to make, then it's probably not the best one. Sometimes I put like a circle about something in the thumbnail, like if it's a bicycle crash, I put a circle on the guy's face or whatever. Or if it's a spider, I'll put an arrow towards the spider's fangs. Mm -hmm. But you don't even have to do that. Just make sure it's a clear thumbnail and that thumbnail has to be in the video ideally. So if you're talking about cakes, it has to be a thumbnail with cakes, not thumbnails with bicycles, unless yeah. you're riding bicycles and eating cake or whatever, you know. So it has to be relative relevant to the, the video, if that makes sense. You can't use Justin Bieber's face and have a video playing with your cats. That's a spam. YouTube will take that off. And do you do you also recommend like copy pasting other people's titles and then changing it a bit so that the title's already proven to work? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, titles are very, very important. Titles, it's first it's thumbnail, then it's title, and then description. That's definitely very, very important. So that's a huge one, description text, SEO words. So let's say uh, people are making videos about me, you know, Drew Rider assaults me or Drew Rider rapes me. That's a really strong you know, keyword. If you say um, assaulted by a vegan dude, no one's looking for that. If you, if you say Drew Rider assaults me, do a video about that, you get, might get 100k views, you know. Right. So, yeah, you can uh, definitely use that controversy title, it'll work. And what advice would you give? So, I, I like the assets thing, right? You said, like, what are your assets? That helps, that's gonna help you stand up, like, just double down your assets. I remember many years ago, like six years ago, I was like beatboxing in the shower in the mirror, and you're like, Ted, you should beatbox in every video. I never ended up taking your advice, but I'm sure if I did, that would really make me stand out. I'd be known as like the beatboxer guy, right? Um, are, you, are, you beatbox, are you beatboxing on TikTok? <laughs> I really should, i should be dude dude <laughs> so I have, you link, I have a link to your youtube channel you should also beatbox on youtube as well beatbox everywhere instagram youtube tiktok and link it all to you back to your youtube yeah so anyway i never ended up taking that advice but i like that advice it definitely makes if me i can beatbox i'm beatboxing every video 100 percent 100 percent the trolls would <laughs> love it the trolls would drop it man it would be like the mic drop if i could beatbox but <laughs> well, you can every video okay so every video. The, the next question though in addition to assets how do you actually find your niche like you got assets but how do you find your niche and use the assets in the niche well, what, what are you passionate about like, my passion is bicycles is vegan health and fitness it's weight loss it's nature spiders you know shoes so i make videos about all those subjects Right, so and you, some people, you have like a catalog of, of subjects then. Yeah, I'm like the Walmart, you know, and that, uh, that's not the best of subscribers. I find people subscribed and they unsubscribe. I probably lost maybe you know, 180,000 subscribers over the years for like, uh, you know, upload about cycling. People subscribe, oh, I'm, I'm a cycling. And then you do something about vegan, they're like, I'm not a vegan, unsubscribe. Or you do something about vegan, no, I'm subscribing. And then you do something about cycling and running. I don't cycle and run. No, yeah. unsubscribe. I'm not a runner. I'm not a cyclist. Unsubscribe. So, but I don't care because I'm here to educate people and get views. So subscriber numbers don't mean anything to me really nice. in terms of 
that's, that's, that's not my measurement of success. I mean, subscriber base can be like, oh, anyway, you got 3 million subscribers or you got 10 subscribers. Okay, we can see where you are a bit. But what makes me happy as a content creator is making content that I want to make, that I would have liked to have heard when I first started this journey. And I'm trying to mold people or I am molding people into, you know, clones or drones or, you know, bots or whatever you want to call it, of people who are out there who've got mad fitness, looking great, making cash, helping the environment, building community. You know, it's just a template to follow, do not a template, do not a protocol, whatever you want to call it. And it sounds cultish, but people who follow my template have outstanding lives. And they, they change it. They, it's an emotional template as well. It's not just about making money or getting hot and fit or fast. And, and mentally as well, you know, that's the, the emotional muscle is the biggest part of your life. And you can have everything and anything in your life, but if you don't have an emotional muscle, then you'll end up like Robin Williams. You'll end up like Robin Williams and you'll take your own life or whatever. Mm. You know, so that's what we're looking for is that emotional muscle hypertrophy where you build that emotional muscle and you get more context and perception in life that helps you and helps those around you. I love, I love how you mentioned that you don't care about subscribers and that's one of the biggest vanity metrics out there, right? How many followers? Oh, man. I wish YouTube would take it off. I wish YouTube would take off subscribers, likes, dislikes, and views. Cause, and then, then people can think for themselves, do I like this content or do I like this content because this is trending right now? Yes. You know, like, that would be the best ever. And I remember hearing Gary V talking about that. And I'm like, Gary V's on it. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, and someone like myself, you know, that's easy for someone with no subscribers to say that. But I've got, you know, 200 million views and blah, 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 over 300 million views across my channels. And, and so I would love it if they took everything down, view, like, stat-wise. And so then people can just get on there and go, do I connect with this person? Because we live in this social narrative of, like, people follow what the trend is what the media says and then CNN and all that. So if we could just let people understand critical thinking, that would, I think be, be the world would be in a better place. And for those young people out there as well, those 10 year olds, those 15, those 20 year olds using social media, they're just chasing validation, validation, you know, qualification. And that's leading to depression and, and craziness. You know, people are like, Oh, I got five more likes than you. I'm better than you. It's like, mm -hmm. nah, you know, he might have bought those likes or whatever. So it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can get rid of all the likes and the views. You know, it just, it damages people. Right. And and so you damages now, kids. yeah, you now, like we said, you make all of your income through eBooks, through coaching, um, through through ads and um, the, your bike company. Well, tell us a little bit about your bike company. Yeah, basically I, uh, you know, I've, I've got about 47 bikes at the moment, owned a lot over the years, 22 years of racing, et cetera. And just, you know, buying, you know, top, top end bikes and specialized or, you know, Colnago or whatever. And just having some bikes, you know, have some, some really design flaws, maybe the suspension system bungs up or the, the seat post clamp breaks and you can't get a new one or just things like that. And I'm just like, man, this, the bike industry's going down the wrong direction. They're making more and more, proprietary, harder to fix things, a bit like Apple phones and computers. And these things end up being in landfill more than being repaired and fixed and, you know, reused. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, I want to be something different. So I you know, did a bit of homework and found the most proven frame design out there. And uh, there's a, con a company, a factory in China who makes for other were very, very well-known brands, Tour de France teams use it. For my, I can't mention who for my, because of my contract with them, but um, yeah, I've already had people complain to the factory saying like, tell this Durand Rider guy to shut up, you know, on social media about, you know, you, we're using the factory as well. And so they, they said, well, you know, we, we'll cut you, we'll cut your supply if you keep talking, if you don't delete whatever you said, wow. because I'm a small fry compared to these big brands. So they have more the, say the, over the, that. The factory told you that? Yeah, the factory told me that. That's just business. I get that now. And, um, See, I'm basically using one of these factories, buying frames from them, and they give me a really good deal. And then I you know, make a small markup. Sometimes I don't make anything. It depends on the paint and where it's getting sent, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, I'm just providing a little value service there for people. And it's, those, are, those, are steel, well. those are steel bikes? Uh, there's carbon fiber bikes. Oh, carbon, carbon fiber bike. bikes. Carbon fiber bikes, which is easy to repair. If you do a crash carbon bike, you get it repaired pretty cheap. And so because I'm making a lot of volume sales, then 
you know, make a, make a little bit of income stream there as well. Right. So that's another way. What the bike industry does is they make a massive markup and go for markup sales. I'm going for minimal markup, massive volume sales. Right. And so, so for yeah. someone for someone who's just like, let's say they've been vegan for a couple of years. They, they, they're rocking it. They love the vegan diet. They got great results. They love teaching people. They love helping people. Um, whether it's with fitness or flexibility or relationships or just like Don Bennett style, helping them with their, their nutrients, whatever. Um, or me helping them get started with making money online. Um, they, they have their thing and they want to get started with turning it into a business online. Um, what would you recommend that they begin monetizing in addition to the YouTube channel? Would it be eBooks or coaching or something else? What's the Do it all. To start selling? Do it all. Do it, everything. I remember having this conversation with Maddie Limburner mm. uh, a couple of years ago. Maddie Limburner, she stayed, she actually slept in this, be, um, this, this house, her and Kyle stayed here. Yeah. And um, good, good, good guys they are. They stayed here, they're from Canada as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gee. I remember saying to her, you know, doing an e-book, she's like, oh, I don't have enough subscribers yet. And I'm like, what? She's like, oh, you should have like, a bit of a subscriber base for you back in e-book. And I'm like, no. No, you know, like from day one, put out content for people to buy. Yes. Yeah. People want to spend money. You know, yeah. people want to spend money. That's why like, uh, I put out a lot of free content, but for some people that's not enough. They want to buy something. You know, they want to buy a frame. They want to buy, I also do clothing as well. They want to buy something and, that, and that's great. I love to buy stuff as well. Um, clearly, so clearly, you can see behind you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You gotta, you know, have, something people for people to buy and also supports your you know food and rent your position in life wherever you are at, at that time being so if you give stuff away for free it's not really appreciated that much i've done a lot of free events and it was appreciated by many but then you get you know some some drama sorts turning up and trying to create drama for youtube views and whatever and it's like so if you charge people money then they'll appreciate it more 100 yeah. percent. so very true uh, just monetize anything you can do coaching do product do shirts and you have to you have to work hard you know really you have to hustle it unless you're adding your bombshell otherwise you're gonna have to hustle it you know and even if the let's say the adding your bombshell's got a twin sister and she hustles and the other one doesn't the hustling 18 year old is going to crush it more than the, the lazy one right. right so people see like you know yeah people want to People were so self entitled. Like, I just want to like do minimum and make maximum. And it's like, maybe you could in 2011. And maybe you can if you're that 18 year old bombshell. Maybe she's a hooker as well. Maybe you can, but that's that's not most people. So, right. you know, you got to hustle it and work hard. And when you, and say, love hustle, it. When you yeah. say hustle and work hard, you're like primarily talking about like putting out helpful content, get it, helping people get results. Right? Yeah. That, that, that's you're really always going to. That, that's really something that you that you like you double down on like you you're all about just like let's get you the result let's get you from where you are now to where you want to be and you give them all the steps in between like do this do this do this avoid this avoid this avoid this like and and the thing about you and freely both is you're both very black and white like you guys draw a line like you're like i remember um kevin cosmo ran a marathon and you're like dude if he ran that marathon with like shorter shorts he'd be like two minutes faster like you just like straight up, like if he had shorter shorts on, he'd be faster. You're like, if yeah. you're not running in, in, in Brooks, you're not going to be as fast. Or if you're not using whatever bike, or if you're not carbon up, you're going to be slower. Like you, you draw like lines and you're just like very confident. And, 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 um, and people love that because they know you're not wishy-washy. They know you're not like a fence hitter, you know? Yeah. That, that's like, you know, like a yeah, great, great point. You've, yeah. You've seen that. I always look for the little, we call it marginal gains or just the little things that add up. You know, like, yeah, we're wearing shorts that they keep your legs too hot, then you can't run as fast. So, like, when I was coaching Freely, when we got together, she was dead broke. She was overweight. She would run a 5K, maybe 35 minutes. I got, I got her down to, like, 19.40. She had a million bucks in the bank and, and super lean and fit um, in the end. So, <laughs> and that was, that was by educating Freely. It's the small things that matter. You know, yeah. we've got to look after your thyroid. We've got to you get the sugar into you and the carbs and the rice and the soft drinks and get you on the bike and you know, get you away from that water fasting nonsense and get you away, away from certain other things. And so, and, and we did that. And, and she wanted the results. So she listened to me. We had a lot of fights over the time of like, you know, 
she would listen to me, but then she wouldn't listen to me. I'm like, come on, like, you just, what are you doing, you know? And uh, so, yeah, just Freddie was a great person to coach to learn that, uh, you know, what works, what mm -hmm. works and what doesn't work. So that was fantastic, you know. So yeah. So was, for, uh, for for as many for as many cool tips and tricks as you've given people over the years about how to succeed with veganism and, and raw foods and athletics, I'm very excited to get into part two of this interview with you, where we go into all your tips and tricks on how to be a successful YouTuber and someone who can successfully sell their coaching and sell their ebook. So uh, part two of this interview, we're going to start in just a couple minutes here, where um, you go through a 30 day game plan with us, almost day by day, week by week, on what someone can do. Or what? No, specifically what you would do if you had to start all over again tomorrow with no money, no following, no reputation, but you know what you know now. So how would you get started again, creating the YouTube channel, getting the Instagram up, getting the ebook up, and and, and selling your coaching? What would you do? So um, that's coming up in part two, and I cannot wait. But um, to finish up part one, what would be your last final um, parting words of of wisdom to anyone out there thinking about getting started with um, creating an online vegan business? You have to love it. You have to really want, have a desire that you want to help people and that you want to help the planet. And if you just do it for the money, you can make money, but you won't be happy. You, it won't be genuine. It doesn't matter how much money you make, you will live a miserable life if you're doing what you don't want to do. If you're just living for the money. Well, I mean, we all live, we all need money to buy food and accommodation, etc. cetera. But uh, if we're doing things just for the money, you know, that's, that, that is, that for me, that would be like living torture, just having to do just things just for the money. And, uh, you know, uh, oh, yeah. Just, you got to love it. You have to love it because you're going to get some mad resistance and be yourself. Say what you want to say. And we need more people in the world who aren't afraid to, to really say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Take it or leave it. And that is, that is liberating. You know, like I get to walk around and do my thing and people just, they love me. Or they hate me. There's no one sits in the fence after watching my content for a bit, or they either really just vibe with me strongly, or they're like, "Oh, this guy's got too much truth. I can't handle that." Yeah, <laughs> you know. See, I, that, that, for me, that's just liberating. Just being yourself unapologetically. People can take it or leave it. And uh, there's there's one thing you know, that that's my biggest thing is your life quality is huge, and just being open about what you do. That's that's worth a billion dollars right there. And you're not caring about anything. You're just living your life. You're here to help people. You're here to help yourself, help others, and you're here to make a difference on the planet. And people can just take it. Love it, man. And and yeah, for people they've made it this far in the interview, I just want to say like I reached out to you yesterday, I think it was, or maybe the day before, being like, Hey, do you want to do an interview? And right away you're like, Yes, let's do it. Like sounds fun. Like this is the message I want to get out there something that's clearly changed your life and uh, you just instantly down to contribute, you know? And uh, there's other people I've been trying to get a hold of for weeks and it's just like, they'll say, yeah, 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 and then nothing, yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah, yeah, nothing. It's just like really hard to get a hold of some people, but like, and some people are very elusive, as you know. Well, again, I won't name names, like you mentioned earlier, you're not gonna name names. I won't name names, but some people in the raw food industry or the vegan community, they're very elusive, they're very hard to get a hold of, even when it comes to creating something of value like, like part of the interview. So. Um, someone like yourself really appreciate you just getting on the call like this and just like banging it out right away without much prep. Because I, I would want someone to do that for me. Like, you know, I don't care. Like, you know, if uh, if I do an interview and someone sells that and makes a lot of money off it, I don't care. I don't, I don't want any money from it. Like, good for you. You've taken the action. You made the interview happen. Great. I'm happy to give my information for time for free like this. So it's like that's my genuine thing. I'm not here to I'm not saying oh, how much money will I make from this and blah blah. Like. Whatever, I'm, I'm just here to, to tell the truth because I could be dead tonight. Yeah. And I don't need another 1,000 or 500 or 10 grand or whatever in my bank because what's important to me is you know, getting my song out there. And so another that's, that's, another that's, cool that's, thing uh, you did is, I don't know if you still do this, maybe you do, but you tell people, you just like, you want people to just upload your videos. Just take your video. 100%. 100%. Like, and, like, and, you, and, you wanna... and other people are saying, hey, take my video down. That's my video. <laughs> Like one guy, he uploaded one of my videos and it got over 30 million views. And back in the day, that was probably about $90,000. And I messaged him and said, mate, good on you. you know? And they're like, dude, you're changing my life. Like, I got one guy who lives local to me. He made over $200,000 on YouTube doing, doing videos and you know, following my template. And he's just like, how are you? Like, oh my God, I'm like, this is insane. So it's like, I'm happy for people. You know, I'm genuinely happy for people. If you take my advice and win, 
that's my payment right there. Right. That's my payment right there. Yeah, love people it. turn around and say, hey, Harley, help me out. He's a legend. That's a bonus as well. Yeah, it's always cool. nice to hear, hear that. But, this uh, this, this yeah. interview is already getting me fired up to just make more content. I feel like a, a POS, not putting out enough content. So um, I'm getting stoked on that. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to get into the detailed nitty gritties in uh, part two of this interview where we go into a 30-day game plan, what we can do from day one to day 30 to go from square one, ground okay. zero, to then making some money with eBooks, coaching, and uh, monetizing our YouTube account. So looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Charlie. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you in part two. The last thing the planet needs, the animals need, etc., is you to judge yourself excessively, prevent you from taking action and uploading content to the internet, which is full of pollution. And the solution to pollution is dilution. So we need you to dilute the pollution out there by smashing out more content. And I just want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Canada Vegan Fest, for bringing together hundreds of vegans every summer in Canada from all around the world. See you there at CanadaVeganFest.ca.